I want to welcome everybody who is here online. This is the third of my workshop for the year. We're doing a monthly workshop, just talking about everything that I do and how I do it and what makes it different from any other standard psychiatric practice. The work that I did is just a culmination of reading, research, experimenting, and figuring out what works. So the genetic testing is part of the BrainWell program. This is where it begins, because as you know, the genes is where it starts. And um, we're gonna focus on understanding genetic testing, as well as the focus is, what can I do to help me understand um, how to use it to treat a patient? So that is my focus and how I use a genetic test. This is not, I would disclose it, not really a education on genetic testing in general, but just how I use it. Okay, so um, let's begin. Let's talk about really what is genetic testing. The proper term is actually pharmacogenomics, pharmacogenomics, otherwise PGX. It is the study of the science combining pharmacology and genomics. So the purpose of genetic testing, we really use it to explore how genetics may influence a response to a drug. It is part of what we call precision medicine, which is the new buzzword, but there is a new field called precision psychiatry. And this is the model that emphasizes personalized care based on your specific characteristics. Example of it is how do you use the genome to help determine what medications you use. So why do we use pharmacogenomics? As we know, a genetic testing result will give us evidence and insight to how a patient responds to medication. As we know, it is variable. But I wanna say that even with a genetic test result, we still cannot determine the perfect drug. We still have to use our clinical judgment as well as eliciting the symptoms, talking about what medications they've had in the past, what failed, even family history, what medications the family members have um, responded to. And then using genetic testing, we can then come up with a personalized treatment plan specific for their DNA. So who can benefit from genetic testing? It's kind of sad, but we tend to go to genetic testing only when we have medication failures. And unfortunately, in psychiatry, lots of failures. Treatment resistant depression is 50%. Treatment resistant anxiety is 50%. Treatment resistant ADHD is 25%. Treatment resistant bipolar, depression, two thirds. OCD, 50%. So half of the time, we are not gonna find the right medicine for this patient. It takes time to figure it out. So what I've done with genetic testing, instead of resorting to it as the last resort, I have used it as first line treatment because that way I am not trying to experiment on a patient. I get to the point of what the problem is and use the treatment that is specific for them. So a lot of colleagues of mine, they always say genetic testing does not work. And I think the only reason why they say that is because they're not really using it the way that it needs to be used. I wanna present evidence that genetic testing does work. There's a study in May, 2014, American Journal of Managed Care, it's called Pharmacogenetic Guided Psychiatric Intervention Associated Increased Adherence and Cost Savings. So how did they do this? Well, they ran insurance claims. This was actually a study done by um, Marisa Fava, who is the psych clinical director of Harvard's. So they looked at claims. They compared the people who had genetic testing done versus people who didn't have genetic testing done. What did they find? They said the people that had genetic testing done were more adherent and it also decreased costs by 9.5%. 
this study was an outpatient um, study that they reviewed these claims. So they concluded that you can use genetic testing, pharmacogenomics in everyday psychiatric clinical practice. It doesn't have to be the last resort. Here's another study, April 2015, Journal of Primary Care Companion CNS Disorder. This one's titled Naturalistic Study of the Effectiveness of Pharmacogenetic Testing to Guide Treatment in Psychiatric Patients with Mood and Anxiety Disorders. The objective was they wanted to study the results of genetic testing in a real world setting and to assess the impact on what treatment decision the clinician will come to. What's the method? It was unblinded. What they did was they analyzed 685 patients who had genetic testing done. And the results were pretty good. The clinical global impression improvement scale indicated 87% of the patients had measurable improvement. And they were either minimally much or very much improved. And out of that, 62% has significant clinical improvement. So I'd assume this is a much improved and very much improved um, category. So they concluded also by reviewing these things and eliciting symptoms from a patient, symptoms improved, less side effects and greater quality of life, which is really what a lot of patients come to me because they've been everywhere, they've done everything. And this is the biggest complaint. They said, I'm still not better. I can't tolerate the side effects and my life sucks. So why can't we use a tool today that can help us give these patients improved symptoms, less side effects and greater quality of life? This is what these patients are looking for. So we have an option that we often leave on the table. Last one, I think this is the last one. This is a, one of the later studies, January 2018, Journal of Psychosocial Nursing and Mental Health Care. This is titled Review of Pharmacogenomics in Psychiatric Clinical Care. And they came up with this that in this review, they found evidence that using genetic testing for psychiatric illness shows improved patient outcome, as well as again, decreasing healthcare costs. So does genetic testing work? Yes. Unfortunately, a lot of our clinicians are not using it the way that I do. And with the way I use it, the focus is on pharmacodynamics versus pharmacokinetics, because you have to consider both in order to really get the proper treatment plan. And still, we talked about you have to use your clinical decision to come up with the best plan based on the patient's um, profile, as well as their genetic testing and their experience. Before I talk about genetic testing, what it is, we, let's just go back to talking about general pharmacology. We have to understand pharmacokinetics, which is how the drug moves in the body. In other words, what the drug does to the body, and there are four stages of it. Add me, we have to know this, how the drug is absorbed, it's distributed, how it's metabolized, and how it's excreted. Because all these things will also help us determine what medicine to give, what dose to give, high or low. So I just put um, the list of drug metabolism genes, the CYP and a UGT, and it's useful, yes. And but it's only half of the picture how you use genetic testing. Unfortunately, 90% of my colleagues are just thinking about pharmacokinetics and going through the list of drugs on the line saying, well, if that doesn't work, try the next one. But I wanna flip the script and look at pharmacodynamics. And pharmacodynamics talks about the effects of the drugs and their mechanism of action. In other words, what the body does to the drug. So when you talk about, pharmacodynamics, there's an emphasis on receptors and neurotransmitter relationship, along with the interaction with not only receptors, but the transporters, which is very important in what? SSRIs, right? 
because um, that's the mechanism of action of SSRIs. It blocks that. And so in a sense, that's what keeps the serotonin around. And these are the pharmacodynamic genes. I don't know how much you can see of it, but we're going to discuss at least three of them here in this discussion. And this is really just part one. And then part two is going to talk further about other genes that are of interest in how I use it in clinical practice. So with this, you actually will use a more individualized, precise, <laughs> natural treatment. Sometimes it, it can happen. I have patients who've never been a psychiatric medicine, whose ADHD is better, whose depression is better, whose anxiety is better, because I thought about and read about pharmacodynamics in conjunction with pharmacokinetics. So moral of the story is we have to use both. And the way I use it, I look at pharmacodynamics first before I even decide whether this patient needs psychiatric medicines or do they need natural supplements to support what is missing in their body all along. So the other concept we need to learn is genotype. Genotype is a specific combination of alleles present in an individual. Homozygous means we have two copies of the same allele and heterozygous, two different alleles of the same gene. So this is an example of it. This example, it talks about the gene BDNF, which is one of my favorite genes and um, brain derived neurotropic factor. Depending on what your BDNF is, will tell me how well you will recover from a brain injury. And in this case, homozygous is actually good because north, most of the time we think heterozygous is better. And, but this time homozygous is good because you have normal activity. Your brain, its gene for BDNF is able to function normally and create normal levels versus heterozygous, it is decreased. You're gonna find that we may have learned all this in school, but when it comes to genetics and how we use it and how we use that knowledge, it's not always what we were taught. We have to be open to how the gene is presenting itself. So let's talk about phenotype. What is phenotype? Phenotype is a characteristic in which you see observable effects of the genotype in conjunction with their environment. So let's just say the gene is the blueprint, but, or the design of a dress or a house, and the house or the dress is manifestation of the phenotype. So in many cases, multiple genes can contribute to a single characteristic or trait. And we will see that in some of the genes in genetic testing pertinent to psychiatric care. We also have to think about environmental factors. This is a study called epigenetics. An example of it is skin cancer. UV rays activate the skin cancer gene. What it does, it stops the growth of the skin cancer so you may have a normal gene, or let's just say it's, it is a normal gene to make skin cells. But when you tack on environmental factors, such as an UV rays, it's gonna throw that phenotype out of whack. This is the most important thing for us to understand when it comes to looking at pharmacodynamic genes, as well as pharmacokinetic genes, single nucleotide polymorphism. Before we talk about that though, we have to look at the regular DNA, which is a double helix. It is a rung twisted in a normal double helix strands of DNA. Adenine always pairs with thymine normally, as well as guanine always pairs with cytosine. So you see that, right? You know, A, T, C, G and twisted. So sometimes it looks backwards, but it doesn't really matter. They have to have 
matching pairs, adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine. What is a SNP? SNP happens when there's variations. Adenine may not always connect with thymine. Adenine may connect with adenine or adenine with cytosine, guanine. We don't know. We just have to look at the patient's genomics and figure out if it's normal or not. And this is how we know, through single nucleotide polymorphism. It is a variation at one specific position in the genome. So these minor differences can give us significantly different outcomes. These differences can have dramatic effects on the protein encoded. And what we see in our phenotype can be variable. I am going to talk about the pharmacodynamic genes, but however, I just want to pick on the top three. And if we have time, we're going to get through some of the other ones that I think that are fun, that we really need to understand, that helps us also pick and choose what medications to give our patients. I'm going to talk about the MTHFR gene. That was my favorite gene before. And I thought that was the answer to everything, but I've come to realize in clinical practice, not really. So I have to use my noggin and how a patient responds to it. There's people that would normally respond to the treatment for it, but then they don't. So still, we have to go back to us being clinicians and using our intellect because we got here because we weren't dummies, right? So we have to use that and, and our critical thinking in how we guide a patient into their treatment. Because I had patients, like I said, I gave them treatment and I thought this should have worked for you, but it didn't, or they had side effects. And if you don't consider other things, so this is why we practice precision psychiatry in what we do, because we have to think about all the other things. But for the sake of this lecture, I want to talk about like how I use genetic testing and how I use it to really help my patients. So the COMPT gene catecholamine methyltransferase, that's also a mouthful. This gene, depending on what you see, if it's either normal, high, or low, this is going to determine how you go about it because it's very dangerous if you don't know the difference. You can cause a bad outcome if you do not see whether a patient's enzyme activity to metabolize dopamine estrogen um, in your treatment plan, you could cause the opposite reaction or just make things worse. BDNF, talked a little bit about that. And these other genes, if I get to it, and I'm just gonna pick a few that I think that is fun to know about in clinical practice, especially with the way that I'm moving towards more of a integrative and I want to utilize lifestyle um, modalities to help my patients get better. So let's talk about MTHFR, another mouthful, methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. What happens in normal methylation cycle, and this cycle was actually a lot messier than this, even though you think it's it's a lot, but I've left the things that are significant for us to understand. It, what I want people to know is that medicine is really simple because it makes sense. If you understand where things begin, you know how things can go wrong and it doesn't change. You know, the methylation cycle is the same. And people always ask me, Doc, can, can, can I get a new genetic test? Maybe it's changed. I'm like, no, you're born with it. This is science. You know, nothing changes. It's that when you have environmental factors, stress, all those things can make this, even if you don't have MTHFR deficiency, it can cause problems. So let's talk about this, beginning with folate, folic acid found in your food. Mm -hmm goes through the folate cycle and methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase makes it to L-methylfolate. And we know about the L-methylfolate, but do we understand the rest of the cycle? 
you have to understand the rest of the cycle in order to really explain to the patient why you need to take those medicines. And some of them are like, it didn't do anything for me. And I took it for two weeks and I'm like, no. I always tell my patients in my clinical practice, I have seen results. You gotta give it a good three to six months because we're not treating the patient with a Band-Aid. Band-Aids can work a little bit quicker, yes, but treating the underlying cause, that is gonna take some time to get the results that they're looking for. However, you can tell the patient if they are not having any problems with medications or tolerating it, and they may see a little bit of improvement, I don't know, a month into the treatment, that means, guess what? We treated the underlying cause. And you know what? You're gonna get those long lasting results. You're not gonna get that 50% failure or 25 or two thirds because we have found what was wrong with them in the first place. So if you look at the um, L-methylfolate, you have the other cyclomethionine. Part of the cycle is homocysteine. So this is the fun one because this is just not about psychiatry. A cardiologist, check homocysteine. And I think a lot of us clinicians here have a medicine background before we went into psych. Myself, I did. I actually did one year of dual training, internal medicine, psychiatry. And I love the science of internal medicine, learning about pathophysiology and regular physiology. And then I found that the practice of psychiatry was really where I belong. And I'm so glad I never lost my love for just general medicine, the theory, because it helps me put the pieces together and how to help the patient. So homocysteine with L-methylfolate becomes, in general, SAMe. And SAMe will interact with tryptophan or tyrosine. If you go tryptophan, that makes serotonin. If you go tyrosine, that makes dopamine. And dopamine does also break down to norepinephrine. It makes all the good field hormones. You need enough serotonin to keep things balanced. You need enough dopamine or epinephrine so you can focus and you, you're not depressed. Let's talk about what happens if you have too much homocysteine. Too much homocysteine in general. Cardiologists check this. Neurologists can check this. If it's high, it's a problem, right? Causes inflammation in the brain, suppression of neural stem cells, it stops it from growing and it destroys the blood vessels. It causes breakdown of the neural cells. It stresses the cells with oxidative stress and it impairs myelination as well as causing plaques and tangles, which is what? what we see in Alzheimer's. So a lot of people just minimize and don't think this is significant. But if you show them this cycle, it is. And it's not just relevant to psychiatry, it's relevant to general medicine. Let's talk about MTHFR deficiency. Um, so we know how it happens. And these are the mental health consequences. If you look at depression, anxiety, ADHD, addiction, eating disorder, you can pretty much pick and choose which neurotransmitter is deficient in each of those. And having MTHFR deficiency can explain that because these people will have a decreased amount of their normal neurotransmitter that makes them feel good. I do want to say that in clinical practice, you can be... MTHFR deficient all your life. But as you know, in life, lots of things happen. Stress, brain injuries, environmental toxins, and just different things in life that causes us to essentially have a quote unquote mental breakdown, even menopause, right? You may have not dealt with that all your life and all of a sudden you are crashing and this gene, the deficiency in this gene, can't explain why that happens. Taking away the blame from the patient again, saying, it's just not me. And these are the medical consequences as, you know, with homocystinuria, you have blood clots, strokes, heart attacks, MI, 
recurrent spontaneous abortion. It's interesting that I will ask my patients or they will tell me like, you know, I haven't been able to have a child or like I had problems. And it goes back to this. Neurologic issues, as you know, too much homocysteine affects the brain cells in a bad way. Ataxia, neuropathy, microcephaly, scoliosis, anemia. What I want to talk about with anemia is, let me see if I can go back to here. Notice how if you cannot convert the L-methylfolate or you don't have it, you know, B12 is not working. So why do we check B12 in patients complaining of fatigue, right? Problem with B12 deficiency, macrocytic anemia. What I want people to get out of this is that we do, humans, the body does not live in one concept. We have to integrate everything. What are the causes MTHFR deficiency? It's in the SNP. We explain that, right? These are variations, abnormalities in the genome. We talk about the phenotype, that there are several genes that can cause the same thing. We still don't really know a lot about which genes cause what, but we're starting to learn. And even the obesity gene, there's 400 of them that is involved in figuring out how somebody can gain weight. Let's talk about the SNP and MTHFR gene, known as the most common one that we see is 677T variant. We replace cytosine with thymine instead of guanine. So instead of CG, CT. It reduces the activity by 35% because of the T allele. The next gene involved in MTHFR deficiency is A1298C. This reduces, or let me just say adenine is replaced with cytosine instead of thymine. So instead of AT, we got AC. So this reduces activity by 20% because of the C allele. Is it possible to have the two combinations? Yes, and it is additive actually. 35% decrease in MTHFR deficiency with 677T CT, and you add it with the SNP of A1298C, 20%, you will have a 55% decrease in MTHFR deficiency. So sometimes you may not, like I said, you may not feel the manifestations of this condition, but under periods of stress, or any kind of toxin or any, any kind of insult like a brain injury, you're gonna feel it because you know what? Your brain ran out of gas. It can't keep up with the demand. You have the decrease in MTHFR activity, decrease in L-methylfolate. There's a pop quiz. There's only one gene where you see elevated homocysteine. You just have to remember it's six, C677. And the treatment for it, L-methylfolate, you have to give them 15 milligrams. There are cases that we don't, but in general, if you have pure MTHFR deficiency, 15 milligrams is the recommended dose. And the studies have shown if you add it to an SSRI, it's better than an SSRI therapy alone. Why? This is the reason why there's failure. What if you're not making enough of your own serotonin, dopamine, or epinephrine? It doesn't work. Or let's just say you're not going to get the robust effect because there's nothing to keep around or there's not enough to keep around. So let's talk about the COMP-T gene. That is catecholamine methyltransferase. It breaks down two things. And for sake of sight, we normally correlate it to breakdown of dopamine. But you, are, you can also correlate to breakdown of estrogen. So this is just an a, um, animation of trying to explain dopamine in the frontal lobe. That's where it's most important when it comes to psychiatry. The COMT comes, breaks it down, and you got dopamine degradation. But yeah, that sounds pretty simple and all fine and dandy, but it has a significant impact on patients. Because you can't just say, oh, they're comp T and you know, this is what we do. 
No, you have to look at which way they go. So this is fun. The low comp T is what I call the worrier gene. It is known as AA slash met met, meaning you have slow metabolism of dopamine and estrogen. What happens when you have high dopamine? Worry, anxious, you're obsessive, you can't tolerate stress, don't like change, and you can be psychotic. I find this a lot in schizophrenics. When it comes to schizophrenics, they are really hard to treat. But if you know this, you can talk about tampering the dopamine gene, not just with antipsychotics, but perhaps with beta blockers and alpha-1 agonists. And I have a patient with that cocktail, really bad schizophrenia. Once that cocktail was done and the patient was stable on it, no more anxiety, no more psychosis. The clinical impact of treating low CompD is not just to say dopamine blocker, which is, you know, you, you should start with that if the patient could tolerate and if they would agree to it. Because a lot of times patients won't because that's an antipsychotic doc. I'm not crazy. I don't have psychosis. Why would you give that to me? I have to explain to them, listen, you run high dopamine. This is the way to bring it down. I'm going to talk about also natural ways in the end, but sometimes when they're like having breakdowns, you got to go. You know, we don't forget in general psychiatry that we have to treat the symptoms as it is right now, or else it will lead to a bad outcome. So I'm not against using psychiatric medicines in the meanwhile, because that'll work a little bit faster than the quote unquote holistic way of treatment, because you got to bring down the crisis. What happens when you have high estrogen? You get moody, you overreact. Women get this way pretty bad when you have too much estrogen. I don't wanna say that this is a bad thing all the time. You, I find that low compte people are very good. They're reliable. They remember everything, but Sometimes they don't always play well with others because they are set in their ways. And if you move anything, kind of like who moved my cheese, it's not good. And these people cannot tolerate too much stress in a work environment. You wanna pile on things for them and they don't wanna say no. And then what happens? They quit their job. They're like, they can't function. They're anxious they can't make it. I, I like to tell my patients this. Once I figure out they have the warrior gene, I say, your prescription is don't take on anymore what you're doing right now at work. And you tell them, this is what my doctor told me. So it empowers people to say, you know, it's not just about medicines. It's about wondering what the level of stress you could deal with in life. So these are the things that you can see low comp to eat. Anxiety, you know, too much dopamine, you're anxious. Social anxiety, panic disorder, OCD, they're very obsessive. May not be to the point that it's clinical, but they like things the way they are. Don't move it, don't touch it. And if you, if you let them be that way, they'll be fine. Autism, this is interesting because autistic people are not antisocial, or, meaning that they don't want to be around people. They're just anxious. They just don't know how to connect, but they desire it. So treating the low comp T in autism, if they have it, brings down the anxiety, brings up their socialization. I've seen this in my patients who say, yeah, I have autism. I said, okay. And I'm, I'm at a point where like those diagnoses in the DSM criteria, they're great and dandy. They help me figure out what the patient is, but that's not the end of it because I look at their genes and I can understand why. So yeah, PTSD, you know, hyper reactions to any trigger and re-trigger. If they run high in dopamine, that's gonna happen. Bipolar disorder. There are times when, yeah, the dopamine is way too high. What happens? They get manic, they get psychotic. And I already talked about schizophrenia. PMDD, you know, right before a woman has her cycle, 
the estrogen can run high and it's already high. So that's why these women suffer more from PMDD. Postpartum, we always talk about a woman glows during her pregnancy. That in bipolar disorder, we were always told bipolar disorder is protective in pregnancy. Why? It is hormonal. After you deliver, you have that drop in progesterone that was keeping you calm, and now you don't have it. Now that you understand the impact of the neurotransmitter in a patient, every symptom that they have makes sense. So how do you treat it? It's a three-prong approach, and I'm gonna talk first about the natural approach or the non-medication approach. Diet, you eat more cruciferous vegetables, black seed, soy, oat straw, low protein diet. Why do I say that? Because amino acids make dopamine. So I'm not saying that you can't have protein. I'm just saying, be careful. Don't be going crazy and talking about, I'm gonna go on keto because that's not good for you. It's not, it's gonna make you not sleep. It's gonna make you anxious. This is exactly the story of the psychologist who went through the same thing. And um, that's what happened. You know, like she wasn't feeling good. So she doubled down on her keto, doubled down on her cardio exercise or exercise in general, ate more berries and she crashed and she didn't understand why. Obviously you wanna avoid alcohol or drugs. You can have people who have low comp who struggle with alcohol drugs. But when I ask them, how do you feel when you do that? I feel terrible, but that's the only way I know how to like cope with life. Another prescription for them. You can't have alcohol or drugs because it will elevate your dopamine. And why is it you should avoid berries? Berries are what we call phenols. Phenols make dopamine. So I, I'm talking about exercise. You should use more relaxation exercise, exercises, yoga, Pilates. In the beginning, you should avoid vigorous exercise, cardio interval training. I do have patients that I do recommend these things, even if they're low comp T. You can have the ability to exercise and do interval training, even with low comp T, but everything else has to be balanced, especially your hormones. So these are the supplements, mainly antioxidants, your vitamin C, D, zinc, glutathione, lithium, magnesium. Um, these things balance the effects of the dopamine in mm -hmm. the brain. And with too much dopamine, what do you need to do to compensate it? You need to compensate it by increasing the serotonin. And you can give an SSRI, but I like to start with the building blocks, tryptophan, but I prefer mostly 5-HTP because tryptophan will quit working in the long run. It's a short-term um, treatment. 5-HTP will not quit working. It doesn't build that blockage continuing to make serotonin. GABA promoters, you know, anything that will bring down the anxiety through GABA and pregnenolone. And why pregnenolone? Pregnenolone increases GABA naturally in the brain. So think about this. Why do women in their 40s and 50s, when they go to a doctor and say, I have anxiety and I need my Xanax? It's because in normal physiology, the pregnant loan goes down because we don't, you know, your body is saying you don't need it that much. But we've come to realize that there is so much more psychiatric benefits when it comes to hormones, even pre-hormones. So I talked about phenols. Phenols make dopamine. And these are the things that can make dopamine. Green tea, curcumin, quercetin, amino acids, even L-methylfolate, SAM-E, and high-dose B vitamins. I don't think I even really have to explain to you why you have to avoid these things. Because I, I showed you the methylation cycle. With the methylation cycle, B vitamins, SAM-E, those are the things that are involved in making other than serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. So let's talk about the psychiatric meds for low comp T. Um, of course, the first thing I like to reach to is antipsychotics, but if the patient flat out refuses, then I can give them a beta blocker if they can tolerate it. 
alpha agonists, meaning the clonidine, the guanfacin, and GABA promoters. As you notice with anxiety, giving them more GABA is going to decrease the effects of dopamine. Benzos, buspar, seizure medicines. And out of the all the antidepressants I like to give are the SSRIs because it does promote the increase in serotonin. I would avoid anything with SNRI because it has norepinephrine, even the older medications, the TCAs, those are what we call like dirty SSRIs and MAOI inhibitors. Those are all will help the body make more dopamine. So SSRIs is the way to go. First line. It makes sense now why we, we would avoid Wellbutrin because it does increase dopamine, the SNRIs, the TCAs, MOIs, and stimulants. Stimulants are, are not good um, for people with low comp T in general. The ADHD medicine that I use in low comp T that I reach for so long as I tolerate it is Intuniv because this is the reason why Intuniv will work for some people. It will not work for people who are opposite. In fact, it makes them worse and depressed because you're blocking that receptor already. For more information, this website, berkeleywellbeing.com slash CompT program. This was the program I was talking about, about that psychologist who kept doubling down on her dopamine, thinking that was gonna help her. And then she crashed. She actually has a good program that you can tell patients to go to. It's not necessarily step by step, but general guidelines on the things that you need to do in your life to decrease the effects of dopamine. She also engages the effects of estrogen in the recommendations she does, because we can't forget that. That's there. The other way around, high comp T. This is what I call the warrior gene. This is known as CC valval in your genetic testing, high metabolism of dopamine. What happens? This is the people who are dopamine deprived and low estrogen. What happens when you don't have enough dopamine? You can have, this is what I call the ADHD gene. You don't have enough dopamine in the frontal lobe. Uh, explained a little bit about that earlier about the comp T. You, don't, you can't remember things. You feel depressed, you don't have enough dopamine. You get apathetic because you don't have enough dopamine. You can have major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, ADHD, impulse control disorder, gambling, binge eating disorder, chasing that dopamine, along with substance abuse, cocaine, opiates, alcohol. So these people will do anything to try to get that dopamine, which I've also, I think this is probably in theory, one of the reasons why people cut because they just wanna feel good. They wanna release that dopamine. And so I really believe naltrexone may not always be the choice for cutters because we wanna block that dopamine. So we wanna prevent that. I think that'll make them worse, but probably with people who run high in dopamine, I think that's a good one to do because they're already running high in dopamine. You wanna cut that down, cut down the anxiety. So there are good things about these people. They function great in chaos. These are the people that work in a fast-paced environment, stockbrokers, people in the ER, EMTs, police officers. It's a good thing. And you would be surprised how many police officers I have that come in because they have ADHD. And I later on find, oh my gosh, <laughs> they have the warrior gene. That's why they go out there and you know they take those risks. But sometimes it gets them into trouble. They multitask really good. Why? Because they can't sit still. They got to go from one thing to another. However, when things are going array in their life, too much stress, that low dopamine is going to cause problems. So also, it's a three-prong approach. Totally opposite. High protein diet, keto, atkin, berries, because of the phenols. Exercise, because we want to increase dopamine. Vigorous exercise, cardio, interval training, anything to get that dopamine up. Patients that don't want to take psychiatric medicines or they can't tolerate psychiatric medicines, even the normal supplements that I give them. I said, well, you're gonna have to do this approach. This is your prescription. You gotta go out and run 30 minutes a day. 
in order to increase that dopamine as natural as we can. And the supplements, tyrosine. You understand now why I give tyrosine. It makes dopamine, norepinephrine. The phenols, phenols are what we call um, dopamine ingredients. You find it in green tea, curcumin, quercetin, just general amino acids. I would like to say though, the patients that come to me for weight loss, I get excited when I see that they're high comp tea because I can give them everything, stimulants, anything that increases dopamine. And um, as you know, in general, a high protein diet, vigorous exercise is a way to lose weight. Knowing this about a patient who may wanna to come to me for weight loss, I have to explain to them, this is the reason why you're struggling with weight loss, but this is gonna be an advantage to you that um, as we know, keto diet, vigorous exercise, especially cardio and interval training are a great way to lose weight. What are the psychiatric meds for high comp tea? Anything that increases dopamine, well, butrin, SSRIs, TCAs, MAY stimulants. This is why I call the high comp tea the ADHD gene. Normally, Adderall is better, but there is another gene that can play a part in this. Why you would go with the methylphenidate base or the amphetamine base. Let's talk about dopamine blockers, antipsychotics, very bad. One of my NPs had a patient come in. They said, I feel bad, I, nothing works. And they found out she's high comp tea and she was on Abilify, not good. The minute she took off that Abilify, the patient woke up, perked up, depression was gone. Beta blockers, you know, all these things tamper effects of dopamine and alpha agonists. Those are things that tamper dopamine in the brain. But we're not done yet because there are complications this is why I say you have to consider pharmacodynamics before you start throwing meds in a patient. What if they have MTHFR deficiency and COMP-T activity abnormality? MTHFR deficiency with low COMP-T. Think about that cycle I showed you. What happens? You lack the ability to make serotonin, dopamine, and epinephrine, but the little dopamine you have around sticks around. So this is the time where I would give a lower dose of L-methylfolate. But I do warn the patient, if you get anxious, even with that low dose, you better stop it because that's what's happening. And that's happening with my patients, even at low dose. So sometimes when they have this problem, I give them a super, super low dose of L-methylfolate, sometimes only like 800 micrograms <laughs> because they need something, but they don't need a lot then sometimes I will add the serotonin-based supplements, tryptophan, 5-HTP, because it makes serotonin. And if you understand that cycle, there is no increase in the dopamine. Talked about SSRIs, will also keep the serotonin around, counteract some of that um, dopamine. I love this gene because this is what I call MTHFR deficiency with high comp T, the double whammy gene. And I saw that in a patient yesterday. Uh, he came back as a follow-up to discuss his genetic testing. And I saw this low serotonin, low dopamine, low norepinephrine, and the little dopamine you have around, it's gone. So I asked that patient, I said, how long has it been that you've been suffering from depression? And he goes like, well, doc, probably since I was a kid. This combination can explain a lot of things. So what do we do? As we know, there is hypermetabolism of the dopamine. I often start with L-methylfolate, but if they're really like really, really bad, then I will add that tyrosine because you know there's that deficient in dopamine and a hypermetabolizing dopamine. So knowing, going back to that cycle, why I would give L-methylfolate and tyrosine. And of course, this doesn't work right away. Melanie, we have that patient, mutual patient who had that problem. Mm -hmm. It took how long? I would say in the six month, he was Easily. amazing. Yeah. And he's afraid, is this gonna go away? I said, no, because we were treating the underlying cause. All right, let's talk about BDNF. The purpose of BDNF, it changes the formation of new brain cells and protects existing ones. So its function is 
increases brain, brain plasticity, which is very important for people with traumatic brain injuries, especially among my NFL athlete patients. And this explains why some of them will recover from a brain injury better than others and why some will still suffer from cognitive impairment or finding difficulties, memory loss, just general functioning in daily life. Suppresses brain inflammation. Inflammation is a huge thing now when it comes to explaining why people feel depressed. And it acts as a natural antidepressant. Why? It makes the brain healthy. It's all about brain health. Everything starts here. It's not about like how you feel. And it offsets the negative effects of stress on the brain because it's anti-inflammatory and it protects the brain from neurodegeneration. So I picked on this example before, the ones that are poor secretors or BDNF are the ones that are, we call the met carriers. They have lower levels in the brain compared to others. So what are the symptoms? When we talk about the function, then we can understand why somebody will be depressed, why somebody will have unstable mood, somebody will have anxiety, cognitive impairment, inattention, memory loss. The treatment for it, it's really just a three-prong approach. How do you increase the BDNF in a patient that is a low secretor of it? Lithium, lithium does it. I think this is the reason why some bipolar patients don't respond to anything but lithium because we didn't realize that they were poor BDNF secretors. But the good news is you don't necessarily have to give therapeutic lithium. I, this, I give some of my patients this five milligrams of lithium orotate and they do just fine. So this was proven in a journal, Journal of Alzheimer's Disease, Lithium Increased BDNF in Early Alzheimer's. Intermittent Fasting, the Journal of Brain Science, February, 2021. Intermittent Fasting showed to increase BDNF. Exercise, interval exercise particularly. eLife Journal, June, 2016, it releases Exercise releases beta hydroxybutyrate in turns induces BDNF promoters. So if you can see this treatment, they don't necessarily have to have psychiatric medicines, but lifestyle is how they treat the low BDNF. So for more information, this is a source I use. Genomine, it's great. Oops, I wasn't supposed to mention that. <laughs> but they've taught me a lot. It really, really changed how I look at genetics. So instead of looking at the back saying, uh, A, B, C, D, this is what I should give. I start with this in order to help me understand which direction to go with a patient or not. All right. Thank you, everybody. It was great to see everyone. And I appreciate you all showing up. Now you understand why I do things the way I do. And it's not just, you know, I didn't pull anything up from the sky. People talk about, you know, <laughs> holistic integrated practice is hooey. I said, no, I use the same science as you do, but I actually use it the way it's supposed to be used. But if you have any other questions, don't hesitate to send me a question or all that. I, I want to be able to help everybody understand and explain why we do the things we do, what makes us different from other standard psychiatric practice. It's great to see everyone. Thank you.